When you think of blossom and rot, you probably don't think nitrogen, but what if I told you that nitrogen plays an even bigger role in blossom and rot than calcium, magnesium, or even your soil pH? Let's get into it. If you're new, this is the series where we look at all 17 essential nutrients, and nitrogen is a primary macro that I did skip over, and many of you are going to note that. The reason why I skipped over it is because the first few I filmed were like over an hour to an hour and a half and I'm gonna cut it down just because it's a big topic. There's a lot to know about nitrogen and it's also the industry that I work in so it makes it like even more passionate for me to speak about. However, I've told myself I'm going to goose raba and rein it in here today and make this video hopefully under 20 minutes. Now the reason why it's considered a primary macro is because it's foundational to amino acids, proteins, and namely, most importantly, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the mechanism in which photosynthesis can even take place at all because it's what captures the sunlight. So without it, your plants are hooped. It's also, like, this is so random, you probably don't care. It's part of something called protoplasm, which is this substance that is in plants that we don't really fully understand, uh, but it sounds cool. So I'll just throw it in there, protoplasm. Yeah, it's a thing. It is not off Ghostbusters. So I think the best way to break this down is to speak to the fact that there is different forms of nitrogen and plants have different preferences for which forms of nitrogen they take up. So you're all familiar with the nitrogen cycle. We're not gonna get into that. However, there are different types of nitrogen in that cycle that we want to focus on. So number one is nitrate. Now trait, is always referencing three oxygens. And this is a nitrogen with three oxygens on it. Now what makes this particularly unique is that when it is in soil, it does cause a bicarbonate as a waste product from the plant uptake, which causes an increase in the pH of your soil. So if you are in an area that has relatively alkaline soil, alkaline water, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, prairie provinces, all the way into the US, these soils you probably don't wanna add a fertilizer that has nitrate particularly in excess because it can just continue to bump it farther up into a more alkaline state. Uh, this also may be true if you're trying to grow like acidic plants. Now the other form of nitrogen is ammonia and ammonium. Ammonium, despite popular belief, is not the yummiest. That's how I remembered this in, in school. Anyways, ammonium is not yummy to the plants. It's icky in the sense that it's the less preferable one of the two for the plants to uptake. So while nitrate's number one, ammonia has number two, and that is a nitrogen with three hydrogens attached to it. Now, this sucker is volatile. It is not a happy camper. It is constantly trying to run away from its job of fertilizing the soil and the plants. It is trying to globalize. It is trying to leach out of the soil. She's wild. And a great example of this is anyone that works with anhydrous ammonia. And that is literally the gaseous form under pressure of nitrogen with three hydrogens. And if you expose this to air, you typically see a big plume of smoke and it's not smoke it's actually the nitrogen with three hydrogens trying to catch all the hydrogens floating around in the atmosphere in the form of humidity and so it, it can be quite fascinating to watch happen it also is very dangerous to breathe and it's dangerous to get on your skin because your skin has hydrogen in it as well and Ammonia, she's not biased. She will just take the hydrogen out of your skin if she needs to, and it can cause some pretty nasty burns. In the soil, it's constantly trying to gas off, which we call volatilization, and it's constantly trying to leach out via catching onto water and hitching a ride out through gravity. Now, because it is so volatile, we don't see it very often in soils in excess. So if we have a soil that's incredibly wet, meaning too wet, this gases off. It tends to gas off into the atmosphere. If we have soil that's too dry, there's nothing really for it to capture onto. So again, when we see losses, there's kind of a sweet spot for this one to exist. However, if you get it into the soil and you get it in the soil, you throw some soil over top of it, pack it down. That soil has some moisture in it. It stays put. It does not leach. It does not volatilize. Once it goes back into the nitrogen cycle and does it sing, it will, but otherwise it's pretty darn stable. Now it's a little least desirable for for the uptake of for plants because the plant roots do have a charge to them, meaning they do need a 
a molecule that is relatively unstable for uptake. And ammonium doesn't fit the bill because of the four hydrogens. It's very stable, it's very happy. She's not looking for more. She's not polyamorous other than her four hydrogens. So that is why it's the less preferable of the three. Now, what I will say about ammonia and ammonium is that when in the soil and when they kind of do their thing with bacteria, they tend to actually decrease the soil pH. So in many cases, if you have a soil that is on the alkaline side and you're actually trying to reduce the soil pH, putting something that has ammonia or ammonium in it can help achieve this. It's also the reason why many farmers in prairie provinces into the US that do have a limestone-based soil can and will use ammonium when it's applicable because it's actually doing them a benefit for the soil that's very likely already pretty alkaline. That is the three different forms. There are fertilizers that have each one of these forms. I'll pop them up here, which ones you wanna grab, depending on what route you wanna go. Now, the other ways we can get nitrogen into the soil, which include, but are not limited to, lightning. And uh, I don't many know many gardeners that have that much luck in their back pocket, depending on how you look at it. So that's probably not the way that your soil is getting it, but that's a fun fact as to how it happens. The next way is actually through rhizobium bacteria. Now this is a bacteria that fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. And it's very specific to a relationship with the legume family. Now the legume family can include chickpeas, peas, beans, literally anything that is a pulse crop. And this symbiosis that is formed makes these really gross looking nodules, kind of looks like an infection, turns out it's not. And these nodules actually pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere into the soil. Now this, despite popular belief, is not readily available in the first year. Meaning if you intercrop with say peas and tomatoes, you're not necessarily getting, well, you're not getting the benefits of that rhizobium bacteria and the nodules within the same year. So companion cropping the two actually makes no sense. Unless of course you're thinking about the future, which I'm sure many of you are. And therefore then if that's the case and you actually cut the pulse crop off at the base and leave the majority of the roots and the nodulation in the soil, those will eventually be degraded by the nitrogen cycle and be available to your plants for use. Someone says just do the three sisters method and put pulse crops between stuff. It's a little bit of a misleading concept because it actually doesn't do much in that first year. Now, the other way that this can actually affect this is via too much nitrogen. So if you dump on a lot of compost, a lot of manures, a lot of synthetics, a lot of organics, blood meals, bone meals, whatever the case is, not bone meal, more blood meal, but anyways, whatever the case is, you want to take into consideration that the more nitrogen present, the lazier the plants and the bacteria become, and therefore the symbiosis does not form. Now, I used to work in this industry, I used to do research in this industry, and let me tell you, it's real. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Mycelium mycorrhizal fungi, I give a little bit of a hard time to, but this one is legit. We. I've seen it. I've seen the biomass being cut down and dried out and weighed and the chemical makeup of these plants being inspected and it works. It makes for a stronger, more durable plant in the initial year if you add rhizobium. Now, just because it's present in the soil in some capacity, a little bit of extra can actually go a long way and that is via the form of inoculation. What one thing to consider though is that the rhizobium bacteria itself is incredibly sensitive to light. So when you actually utilize this product, you wanna do it under shade or even better yet, in the evening slash nighttime or early morning, um, just because you're gonna get more bang for your buck, if you will. For plants that are not legumes, that you wanna see this benefit arise from, I heavily encourage you to think about it for the next year, or you wanna put stuff next year, not this year. Because again, it doesn't necessarily translate into this year's benefits for plants planted near or around pulse crops in this initial year. Okay, so when it comes to deficiencies, let's take a look at what this can look like. And unfortunately, it can look like a number of different other issues because of how integral nitrogen is. So whenever you have any sort of other deficiency that you're suspecting, whether it's calcium or magnesium or sulfur or manganese or 
actually potassium as well. If any of these look like they're lacking, you can actually add nitrogen, and preferably just nitrogen in its purest form, like a 4600 pop that on, see if it reverses it. If it does not, then you know it's actually one of the other nutrients, but always start when diagnosing deficiencies, start with nitrogen and just see if that is the issue because it can pop up in so many different shapes, forms, and sizes. So number one, the whole friggin' plant looks pale yellow, pale green. Now you will see this mostly in the top, similar to sulfur, unfortunately. Um, you can see it on the bottom. You also will see leaf drop. So the dropping of leaves that are a little bit older, the ones near the base of the plant, this doesn't always mean a nitrogen issue. It actually just means that the leaf itself has served its duty as a photosynthesis warrior and it's just time to go to bed. However, it can also indicate a nitrogen issue. And stunted growth, just, growth that doesn't look right. And this can look like a calcium issue as well. It, it can look like deformed leaves, particularly the new leaves. It can look like as though it's growing slower than what other plants appear to be growing. You name it, those kind of all fall into that zone. Now, excess, it actually looks very similar. So excessive levels of nitrogen mean lighter, paler leaves. It actually can be more rapid growth and the tissue is gonna be softer and more malleable, which isn't a good thing, by the way, because that introduces more disease. It's easier for bugs to get at, you name it. So we actually don't want that to happen. Or it can look like straight up burnt leaves because of the fact that it's just making things difficult overall. How nitrogen affects the uptake of other nutrients is quite fascinating um, in the sense that it's directly competing with magnesium and calcium, which are the causes for blossom and rot. And the way that it competes with the plant's root is the, the roots themselves have various different mechanisms for uptake. So there's, for example, mass flow which is probably the simplest version. It's just literally moving across the a gradient. There's actives and inactive forms. There's different transport mechanisms for it to go up. And some of them are actually quite sophisticated. Now, nutrients usually have one way of getting into the plant. And unfortunately, several nutrients have to utilize the same mechanism to get into the plant. And the nutrient with the greatest charge or the easiest way of getting through outcompetes everybody else. And nitrogen outcompetes everybody when it comes to uptake. So if you have excessive levels of nitrogen, this can actually result in nitrogen being uptaken and calcium not being uptaken, which can end it results in those floppy leaves, for example, or blossom end rot. We wanna make sure we're actually not applying an excess when it comes to this uh, this nutrient in particular. And that's probably what I see the issue for in a majority of cases for a majority of individuals that are gardening. And that is because it literally is just touted as the nutrient you need. And there's also fertilizers out there that have incredibly high levels of nitrogen, despite the fact that it may not be needed. Now, the best way to make sure you are not over or under applying nitrogen is to do a soil test. And you want to just do an easy, cheap one, such as the one that I did in this video right here. And that video down there is about pH and what form of nitrogen you want to add based on that. So that's the video you want to watch if that's the case. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.